how'd you wind up in the Pandora fold? Um, you know, I, uh, I had my own company for a while and then, um, I was speaking at a conference, uh, and there was someone, uh, from Pandora and it was Laura Nagel, who, uh, was the moderator on the panel. Mm -hmm. And, um, we just kind of connected, uh, you know, could tell there's a lot of symbiosis between uh, the things that we were chatting about on the panel. Right. And so she invited me to come out to Pandora to do a presentation. I did that pretty soon. I got invited to more presentations. Um, eventually I was hired to work, uh, on the, uh, development of Pandora's sonic identity. And, uh, in the process of that, we were looking in deep into each other's eyes and just realized this is a pretty good match. So let's put a ring on it. So, uh, they offered me a position and, um, it felt like a good uh, time for a transition. And so I joined officially, um, December of uh, 2018. And you're still there. And I'm still there. And audio in the magic. Middle of a pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Audio magic continues to be made. And long story short, um, do you come from a background of studio work, engineering, and all that? Or are you one of those people who realized, hey, I got an ear for this, and here's how we wind up where we are today? Uh, let me give you the, the shortest version of, of uh, the story as I can. Um, music's always been a part of my life. So when I was a kid, I took piano lessons, started playing guitar in high school, writing songs, because it was a fairly effective dating tool. Um, <laughs> but, but I never thought about it as a, uh, as, as a vocational path. Right. So when I went to university, I majored in psychology. And so I graduated with a degree in psychology. I was just really fascinated with helping professions, but also understanding what made people tick, you know, how, how things worked. And so I was sitting out for a year after I graduated. I had a couple of jobs, one working in a school with kids with severe behavioral disorders and the other doing research and statistics at a community mental health organization. And um, uh, I was getting ready to go to grad school, uh, but I was still kind of dabbling in music and there was never an aha moment. I think I just gave myself permission to do something different. And so I took a detour and instead of going to grad school, I wound up in Nashville. Um, so worked uh, in uh, a lot of phases of the music business in Nashville. Um, my big break came when I started doing dance remixes of country songs. Uh, that, that's a whole other story in and of itself. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, worked with everybody from Tim McGraw to Winona to, uh, Leonard Skinner, Neil Diamond. Um, so it was a fascinating, uh, part of my career. Uh, but I was also writing music for commercials. And as I was doing that, I discovered that I really did like advertising and marketing. I was probably drawn to the creative bit, but also, you know, tapping into some of my background in psychology and human behavior. Uh, and so it was in 2005 that I really just brought all three of these worlds together. You know, the, the psychology, the research, the academics, um, the music entertainment experience that I had, and then the experience in marketing and branding, uh, and started my own company that was basically about helping brands um, develop strategies and sonic identities. Uh, and that kind of, that, that company ran me up through 2018 when I joined Pandora. And so basically, you know, my, my uh, title, Sonic Strategy Director, um, right. I define sonic strategy as, uh, as essentially it's, it's, uh, it's what I call audio alchemy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a blend of sound science and sound art to help our clients make sound decisions. Um, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> sound There's decisions. Al always a lot to play with. <laughs> if if but, there isn't already a music company called Sound Decisions, uh, that, that is there the you go. <laughs> Tra Trademark it soon. Exactly. Uh, so it's this wonderful, for lack of a better term, square peg kind of career you've had where yes. it's like, I guess, those four things that that guy does is a department is a thing unto itself. 
when in your career did you kind of realize that it was good to be that square peg to be an original person? I ask that because a lot of people are kind of pushing themselves to fit the peg hole, whereas right. you, you're your own thing and you've done well and you work with great people. You know, I think, um, I, I think part of it is, uh, you know, kind of following the things that, that you love, um, things that really interest you. Uh, it can become a, a cliche, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily one of these guys that says, if you're not having fun doing it, it's time to quit your job. You know, because look, <laughs> sometimes it's not fun. Right. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard work. But I'm fortunate enough in that I have been able to stitch together these, um, what can seem like divergent uh, you know, paths in my life into something where I, you know, bring them to bear uh, on, and I, I happen to love science and academia, but I also happen to love creativity and chaos that, that can come with that. And, uh, you know, I, there are other guys like me in the world. I'm not singular. There are other people who, you know, look at identity and strategy and, and blend the, the science and the art uh, and the business together. But we are somewhat of a rare breed. Um, and what's been exciting for me in that is that it's allowed me to, you know, take a look at what are some new interesting things to find out about, to learn, to know, how can I push the body of knowledge um, mm -hmm. in, in this area, but at the same time, have it not be just a, an ivory tower um, experience, but things that can impact advertisers, brands, and more importantly, uh, you know, impact the world uh, in, in, in a way, you know, th kind of thinking about problem solving around uh, community issue, issues, society issues, health issues, and how we could bring music sound to bear as a sonic intervention, if you will, in, into, intervention. into wow. our lives. Yeah. Well, Pandora is one of those great, great companies that basically is so great at what it does, it becomes a verb. That you right. say, you know, just like, uh, I'm going to Xerox it, you know, that kind of thing. So right. when you're talking about Pandora, it's everyone's go-to when it comes to, I like this, what sounds like that? Right. And a lot of people love music. I, sh I should say almost everybody loves music, but very pe few people think about who wrote it, who played it, who... You know, they don't read the liner notes per se. And obviously the team at Pandora does all that. But what can you tell me about what it's been doing lately to improve and stay on top of things? Because who knows what genres are going to be invented in the next five years? Right. Well, you know, one of the things that, that attracted me to Pandora is that, you know, Pandora is not only a music company, but it's also a science company. Um, you know, we, we have human curators, musicologists, mm -hmm. uh, that still have a hand in what we call our music genome, where we take over 400 data points, if you will, uh, and analyze a piece of music to understand what, you know, what are the sonic ingredients, the sonic building blocks uh, mm -hmm. of that piece of music. And then, uh, you know, if we want another cake that's kind of like that, but tastes a little bit di different, uh, what are the similar ingredients in, in that song? And then we combine that with, with machine learning to, to help us uh, get more efficient um, and, and make some of those decisions at scale. Uh, but, you know, looking ahead, some of the things that we're looking at here are, you know, in terms of voice interactivity, uh, you know, building our own internal system so that uh, as you're, you're asking for something, it can be a little more natural um, and isn't just adopting another system that's out there that works with our playlists the way that people are used to working with them. You know, I think one of the exciting things that we've done um, in the last year was to develop um, these uh, these moods where if you've got a playlist, you can tell it, hey, just play the playlist as I've curated it or the station as I've curated it. Or give me some more things like this. I want to discover a little bit more or right. dive deeper into the B-sides. 
Um, and it does that really effectively. Uh, and we're also looking at, um, you know, how are people using music? You know, what's the job you want music to do in your life? Do you want it to, you know, help you with a workout? Do you want it to help you relax? Maybe you're working on something and you want to, to focus. So we're looking at these jobs and then again, using the science, the psychology to begin to understand how would we put music together to help you um, kind of develop your own uh, mood states uh, and, and how you might work with those to, you know, either keep it on track or maybe you want to change that up. Uh, mm. How would you do that? So those are a lot of the things that are going on in the background, which are just extensions of what we've always done, which is, you know, loving music and trying to help people find ways to use music that works for them in a very personal way. You know, it's, it's definitely about discovery, but it's also about personalization. You know, if I would describe Pandora as a person, I think Pandora would be the person in the room that um, everybody could talk to. It's, it's that person that you go up and, and you start talking about music and you say, man, I like this. And they're like, yeah, have you heard this band? And you're like, no, I want to check that out. And it doesn't matter what the genre is, but, you know, we get you. Uh, it's a tolerable influencer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or, or it's the musical equivalent of uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Everyone likes <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. We don't know anything about him. We just all kind of like him because he smiles yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and are you one of those people who sees color when they listen to music? I, I think that's called synesthesia. Yes. Um, not, I'm not a synesthete in, in the true sense of the word. Uh, you know, synesthesia is a condition where the brain is, is literally cross-wired. So uh, if you hear a piece of music, you, know, you, you may actually smell that music, or there may be a color that you actually see. Uh, so I'm not a synesthete, um, and yet uh, a lot of the research that I've done has been in the, the uh, realm of, of cross-modal science, which looks at, um, how something like synesthesia exists for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, it's a division of psychology uh, that's called psychophysics, which is just a fancy way of talking about how we um, quite literally make sense of the world. We have sensory input that comes in and we use that to form our perceptions of reality. Uh, so what cross-modal science does is it looks at the way our senses work together how mm -hmm. they inform each other, and then understanding that, how we could actually perform sensory hacks, where maybe I could make a, something that you're um, uh, eating taste a little sweeter, or a little more bitter, um, or you know, a, a little spicier, based on what I'm putting in your ears and not just what I'm putting in your mouth. How can we have these color associations where it feels right or associations with shapes uh, in design or even texture um, or even associations with scent where we're not literally seeing the color uh, or having the taste but it's helping our brain form a perception of of that taste. Steve, you are way too smart uh, to be talking to me. Uh, is your musical taste personally this smart as well? Like, am I going to hear, oh, I listen to lots of Gentle Giant and stuff. Like <laughs> or do you actually like a bit of everything, including really simplistic punk rock? Yeah, I do. I really do like uh, a little bit of everything. I, I tend to way, t stay away from things that really pushes um, uh, arousal, uh, you know, <laughs> th through the charts. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my tastes can be all over the map. I've curated my own uh, Pandora stations uh, based on some of those rather bizarre tastes uh, at time. But uh, I tend to 
when I really want to enjoy something, I will usually listen to classical or jazz. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was because I've worked so long in the industry with pop and rock. It's hard to turn the part of my brain off that starts to analyze it. And, and so it, it doesn't quite do the same thing for me as, as jazz where I can, uh, you know, appreciate improvisation and it surprises me still because it goes somewhere that I didn't expect, you know, or, or, or classical where um, there, there's a depth to things that I can explore without analyzing how the kick is playing against the bass and what was that synth patch that he just used and oh that was an interesting guitar riff um, that was happening. Uh -oh. Well, two quick questions, and then you're a free man. And the first one is, before the pandemic and quarantining and all that started, what was the last concert that you went to? Oh, gosh. I've got to think back because um, I'm not often going to concerts. Um, when would that have been? Oh, I know. Uh, it was actually in uh, Berkeley uh, at the theater near the, the school there. I'm blanking on the, the name because it's the first time I've been, it was the Greek. Uh, and it was Tom York. Wow, okay, that, that was a great last concert for a while. Yes. Wow, yeah. cool. So bringing everything back together, the closing question, Steve, any last words for the kids? And the kids could be anyone you think are the kids. Oh, man. I wasn't expecting that one. And that's good because you're, you're making me think. Uh, think I'm, I'm making you improvise without all the patches and the plugins. Yeah. I would say I would love it if we would really start listening more actively. Mm. And whether that's music or a conversation, you know, I think one of the things you know, one of the wonderful things about the way we consume music now is it's the celestial jukebox in the sky. I can get whatever I want, whenever I want it. And it can be playing in the background. And we do kind of create these playlists that are designed to just play. And right. we're not thinking about them. And there was something really special about, uh, you know, the idea of vinyl records, where it was a multi-sensory experience. You know, you could smell the vinyl, putting things on the groove. People would come over, listen, you would talk about music. And I think I would just encourage folks to listen and pay attention to what else is happening around them. Are they eating something at the moment? Hmm. How does the sound and what they're eating work together? Maybe there's a texture, maybe there are colors around them. Just use music as a way to open up your senses to the world and maybe to each other in the process. And certainly at this moment in time, you know, the ability to actively listen, um, not just to music, but to each other is a, is a really important skill. I can't top that. Well said, great thought, Steve. Keep up all the greatness that you're doing on, on every end. Really, you're doing great work. Pandora's doing great work, so keep it up on all ends. Thanks, man. Well, you know, if there's something else that you need, anything else you want to explore after this, feel free to, you know, hit me up. You can just send me an email. No big Two deal. thumbs up, Steve. Have a great well, rest. I, I thank, thank you for your time, too. I appreciate it. And I'll kind My of look forward man. to seeing how you put your magic together on this and help uh, – Help me make sense. <laughs> you made a ton of sense, and that's that's the easiest part of it all. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, all right, buddy. Well, have a great rest of your week. You as well. Now, take care. Outro cast. <laughs>